This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman in New York City, joined by Democracy Now! co-host Juan Gonzalez in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Hi, Juan. Hi, Amy, and welcome to all of our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. Well, the Biden administration has unveiled plans to withdraw U.S. troops from Afghanistan by September 11th, the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. Biden will formally outline his plan today during a speech in the treaty room at the White House, the same room where President George W. Bush announced the start of the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan nearly 20 years ago, beginning what's become the longest war in U.S. history. The war killed more than 100,000 Afghan civilians and over 2,300 U.S. service members. It also cost the U.S. trillions of dollars. NATO forces are also expected to withdraw its 7,000 troops by September 11th. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki discussed Biden's plans Tuesday. The president has been consistent uh, in his view that there's not a military solution uh, to Afghanistan, that we have been there for far too long. That has been his view for some time, well documented, well reported on. Uh, he believes that, uh, and he remains committed to supporting uh, negotiations between the parties, which many of you uh, may be following are resuming uh, next week. Uh, and he also believes we need to focus our resources on fighting the threats we face today. 20 years, almost 20 years after the war began. Biden's announcement is coming just over a week before the scheduled start of a new round of peace talks in Istanbul between the Taliban and the U.S.-backed Afghan government. But on Tuesday, the Taliban announced it will boycott the talks because Biden's reneging on a deal made by President Trump to have all 3,500 U.S. troops out by May 1st. In recent weeks, the Taliban attacked a secret U.S. military base in eastern Afghanistan, as well as Kandahar Airfield, which houses hundreds of U.S. troops. On Tuesday, a senior Biden administration official told reporters the president's committed to the withdrawal, regardless of the situation on the ground in Afghanistan. The official said, quote, this is not conditions-based. The president's judged that a conditions-based approach, which has been the approach of the past two decades, is a recipe for staying in Afghanistan forever. We're joined now by two guests. Zahir Wahab is an Afghan-American professor who taught for decades um, at Lewis and Clark Graduate School of Education in Portland, Oregon. He was born in Afghanistan and has regularly returned since the U.S. war began in an effort to rebuild Afghanistan's educational system. He was a senior advisor to the Minister of Higher Education Afghanistan from 2002 to 2007. He also taught at the American University of Afghanistan for seven years. And we're joined by Matthew Ho. He's a senior fellow with the Center for International Policy. In 2009, he resigned from the State Department in protest against the Obama administration's escalation of the war in Afghanistan. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Professor Rahab, let's begin with you. What is your response? President Trump said the troops would be out by May 1st. President Biden has extended that to September 11th. It would end the longest war in U.S. history, the number of casualties in Afghanistan, well over 100,000. Good morning, Amy and Juan, and good morning, Ho. Ho and I were on a program at the University of Oregon uh, in um, uh, Eugene uh, some years ago. Uh, thank you very much for having me, and it's great being with you. Um, I um, approve of uh, President Biden's uh, decision to withdraw all of its forces, but I want to point out that the United States and its allies should never have attacked and occupied Afghanistan. It was wrong, it was illegal, and I think it was immoral. Um, but now, uh, the United States and NATO uh, withdrawing the war would end in some ways. Uh, but we have to point out that there's a domestic dimension to the war, uh, and the war amongst the Afghans will definitely uh, continue. Can you talk about the effect of this war for the last 20 years? 
Um, and then what it means that at this Istanbul summit, one side, the Taliban, has pulled out because um, they are protesting the fact that Biden's continuing beyond the May 1st deadline President Trump promised. Right. Uh, as you pointed out, you know, for the last 20 years, I've spent more than half of my time in Afghanistan. I have almost gone there every year and spent the last seven years there full time. Um, we must know that um, this invasion and occupation and the bloodshed um, have destroyed the country, uh, its economy, its institutions, its infrastructure, uh, its education, uh, its uh, way of life, uh, relationships among the different ethnic groups. Uh, this occupation has been nothing short of a catastrophe. Um, and this is why I say, uh, you know, there are three dimensions to the war. There is the domestic dimension, the regional dimension, and the global dimension. Um, and we also should point out that many, many reports by credible institutions, uh, you know, and individuals like Cigar, uh, the uh, Washington Post, and also the Afghanistan Analyst Network have repeatedly uh, demonstrated and documented that uh, the ruling elite in Washington have been lying about the war, and so have the Afghan clique, whoever was in power. So the war was uh, wrong to begin with, and of course, an enormous amount of um, money and um, blood has been invested. And here we are, 20 years later, admitting to the world that this was a mistake and it was a, a failure and it's time to leave. But leaving now would be highly irresponsible because, as I said, domestically, Afghanistan is a very divided country. There are several major ethnic groups uh, and um, that are in conflict. Uh, we know that, for example, the price of guns is going up and that the very people who are actually, some of them, uh, who are warlords, who were warlords and have an enormous amount of blood on their hand, while they're going to be participating in this conference, if this happens, uh, their people are also uh, constituting militias and uh, buying uh, weapons. So uh, while the United States may leave, the war may end for the United States, but uh, the war will intensify um, for Afghanistan, unless something needs must be done, and that is that um, we need to constitute a, a UN peacekeeping force uh, immediately. And uh, while the United States is withdrawing, the United the UN security force or its peacekeeping force should move in and be in place. We also need to establish a trust fund so that no dollars would go into Afghanistan except going to that trust fund and spent with the advice uh, and guidance of an international cadre of development. President Biden says that they're going to withdraw troops, no conditions, um, no preconditions, by September 11th. Um, can you talk about what are the forces that are there? And do you believe that all those forces will leave? Talking about NATO, he's talking about U.S. troops. Uh, but what about m mercenaries, um, private contractors? Yes. Uh, as we know, there are 3,500 uh, known American troops, and there are some 6,000 contractors, many of them from third countries. And there are also some 10,000 NATO forces. Although some of the NATO countries have said that they will uh, extend their stay in Afghanistan, uh, most of them are likely to follow the U.S. example. Uh, as I said, uh, uh, the United States should withdraw, because as long as the U.S. is in Afghanistan, uh, the uh, Taliban war against the Americans and all foreigners will continue. But the dilemma is that when there, there are no forces, uh, outside forces, uh, there will be a war, a civil war, or multiple ethnic wars, or proxy wars uh, in Afghanistan. And we must make sure that, uh, as I said, there is a UN peacekeeping force to maintain peace and law and order so that people can have normal 
lives. Right now, the country is in every way unlivable. You know, tens and tens of people you know, get assassinated every day, other than the, the war between the Taliban and the government forces. But also, if there are no foreign forces, no matter what the shape of the government might be, the Taliban are likely to prevail and take over in just about two months. That's why we need some guarantee, international guarantee, with the presence of peacekeepers to make sure that there's peace, stability, and tranquility in the country and so that the country can be built. But we must also make sure that no money is given to any Afghan government. Um, but also the, the problem is that uh, while these uh, uh, delegations, for example, talk about going to Istanbul, there are right now disagreements amongst the members, the 19 members of the uh, government delegation or the Afghan delegation as to the, the nature of this agreement, its agenda and the items and what it portends for the country. Well, I'd like to bring in uh, Matthew Hull to the discussion, a senior fellow with the Center for International Policy. In 2009, he resigned from the State Department in protest against the Obama administration's escalation of the war in, in Afghanistan. Uh, Matthew Hull, welcome to Democracy Now! Could you talk about your reaction to the uh, recent announcements in terms of the Biden administration policy for the future? Uh, Good morning, Juan and Amy. Thank you for having me on. And, and Professor Zahab, it, it's it's good to be with you. I, I've learned a lot from you, sir. Um, you, this is potentially very good news for the Afghan people. Um, the Afghan war has been going on for more than 40 years. This war begins in the late 70s, and it's been going nonstop since then. So it's really, um, it's not correct for us to say it's only, it's been 20 years, because it's been more than 40 years. Um, there hasn't been a formal peace process in Afghanistan in over 30 years. Uh, so for this peace process to continue to go forward, foreign forces must be removed. Now, you know, Juan, Amy, I've been talking to you all for more than 11 years, and I was just thinking about how 10 years ago I was on with you the morning after the Osama bin Laden raid. And both of President Biden's predecessors have said they would remove all the troops. Um, <clears throat> it's, you know, and so the idea that we may still be here talking about this is what really weighs on me right now. Um, also, regardless of whatever the intentions of the Biden administration are, the onus is now on the Taliban. Um, whatever they do can now give context or reason for the U.S. and NATO to say, look, we're not going to withdraw anymore or, or even possibly resume offensive operations or maybe even send more troops. Uh, this, What this does to me, and this may sound skeptical, but I think if you, again, understanding these post-Cold War wars, as well as all American wars going back to the Native American genocide, uh, this gives the U.S. and NATO a decent interval. This puts, again, the weight of responsibility on the Taliban for the next four or so months. And this allows the administration a reason to abrogate the withdrawal, to abrogate the peace process. Uh, and I say this again because of the evidence of uh, the post-Cold War wars in the Muslim world, as well as, you know, just the general history of American military warfare. Uh, the other thing I think it's very important to remember is that this does not include the thousands of men and women who are part of U.S. special operation and NATO special operation teams, CIA teams, as well as the, um, you know, literally dozens of squadrons of attack aircraft and bombers, whether they be manned or droned, that are in the area, stationed either in land bases or on aircraft carriers outside of Afghanistan. So the potential for the United States to remain involved militarily is quite high, even if all 3,500 acknowledged U.S. troops are withdrawn, as well as the NATO troops. But again, uh, this is potentially good news because this is the step that is necessary for the peace process to go forward, and that's what the Afghan people desperately need. And Matthew Ho, could you talk about the toll on the Afghan people? Uh, you you yourself served in the military uh, in Afghanistan uh, years back. The uh, two and a half million 
Afghans are now uh, officially registered as refugees with the United Nations. Uh, the uh, the impact of this of uh, more than 20, 20 years of the U.S. Uh, period, of, uh, but then there was also the period before that uh, when the Soviets were occupying the country. And this, you know, Juan, this precedes the Soviet occupation. Uh, this really begins in 1973, the same year I was born. So 48 years ago, uh, the king is deposed. And at that point, if you're an Afghan, there has not, there's been hardly a single day without some type of violence or political chaos. By the time the Soviet Union invades in 1979, 100,000 Afghans have already been killed in the fighting. Uh, and, and it's important to remember, because we want to remember what the role of the United States has been in Afghanistan, that the United States starts funding the Mujahideen, the Islamic militants in Afghanistan at least six months before the Soviet Union invades. This was a plan by Jimmy Carter's national security advisor, Zygmunt Brzezinski, to bait the Soviet Union into a trap in Afghanistan to give them their own Vietnam. And so the effect on the Afghans has just been catastrophic. It has been well over 40 years of fighting. Um, millions of Afghans have been killed or, or wounded. Um, the devastation on the Afghan people is hard to imagine. That two and a half million refugees are what's registered right now. But there's been, there have been millions and millions of refugees for the last 40 years. For most of these last 40 years, the Afghans have been the largest refugee population in the world, with the exception of a period of time when the Syrians were. But as the Syrians go back, as that war has wound down, the Afghans, I believe, are once again the largest refugee population in the world. It's something like 70 percent of Afghans subsist on a dollar a day. There is no industry in Afghanistan to speak of. There is no infrastructure. The only industry you can speak about is the narcotics industry, which is heavily dominated by the Afghan government and the Afghan military. The Taliban have a role in it, but uh, for the most part, the, the chief players in the Afghan drug trade are the Afghan government, our, our partners. The Afghan government itself is corrupt and predatory. Uh, the Taliban are, 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 are hideous and horrendous. Uh, but the Afghan government is not much farther behind them in terms of human rights violations. Uh, and as well, too, this notion that somehow we have built democracy. You hear a lot about we can't leave Afghanistan because of the gains we made, the progress we made. And, and that's all—it's it, it, it's propaganda. Uh, the Afghan elections have been incredibly fraudulent since the United States invaded. They, they've only become more fraudulent with each one. So th what, what this effect on the Afghan people has been incredibly disastrous, and the suffering that they have endured uh, and continue to endure um, is, is I, I think it's something that we here in the United States uh, cannot possibly or, imagine. Well, well Howard. Uh, yes, P Professor Wahab, I'd like to ask you as well the impact of this war on the uh, uh, Afghan people, as well from your perspective, uh, and the the prospects. How you what you see for the prospects once the United States pulls out for Afghanistan to re uh, to finally have an era of peace and somewhat stability. Yes, well, I totally agree with uh, uh, Matthew, and that is uh, a country has been destroyed. Um, Ashraf Ghani himself said, you know, that 70 percent of the population lives on a dollar a day and that half of the government revenues are stolen. So the government is highly corrupt, inefficient. You know, it's sort of a, a rentier state, uh, inefficient, ineffective, has no credibility, no legitimacy. Uh, the people live in constant fear. There are about a million and a half internally displaced people, other than the three million or so diaspora, Afghan diaspora. So, and there's no infrastructure. The education system is horrible. Uh, healthcare, people still don't have electricity in the capital, regular electricity, drinking water, food, you name it. There's no work, there's no employment. And anyone who can is in some way leaving the country. So. We have wrecked the country, you know, while occupying it and bombing it. 
we have not really attempted to build this institution and its infrastructure. So, so while leaving the uh, the forces, you know, may solve one of the, the U.S.'s problem, but as I said, uh, there are internal dynamics in Afghanistan, and that there's going to be a resurgence of a civil war, proxy wars, and multiple wars, because Afghanistan, as I said, it's a highly polarized and divided country. The ethnics dislike each other, do not trust each other. Right now, amongst the team members of the Afghan delegation, there are conflicts open. People are arguing, you know, as to who is who and how many of which group, et cetera, et cetera. So, and unless we have solved the problems, you know, uh, the war will resume in, in a more vicious way. That's why I say we must replace the U.S. NATO forces with some kind of a U.N. peacekeeping force. And also we must continue, the world community must continue to subsidize Afghanistan development, but must be done very, very differently. Right now what we have done is we have empowered and resourced the very wrong people, the kind of people who should be on trial, you know, and the people who should probably be in jail. So I worry a great deal why I, I, I agree, and I, I welcome the U.S. withdrawal, but as I said, you know, they're leaving Afghanistan without any kind of a solution, without any um, uh, certainty that, uh, that the country will not go into uh, a, a violent situation. Uh, so I really argue for a UN peacekeeping force. Why don't they? Uh, you know, because we have UN peacekeeping forces in several other countries, and it looks like it's working. Why not Afghanistan? It will be much cheaper, efficient, effective, and sure that the country can stand on its own feet. And finally, we have just 30 seconds, Professor, but Khalilzad, who has served under Trump, has served under Bush from Iraq to Afghanistan, he's Afghan-American, serving now under Biden. Do you hold out any um, uh, faith in him? No. Ashraf uh, Ghani, I'm sorry to say he's a Ph.D., John Hopkins, World Bank, etc. But the man has no basis, no credibility, no legitimacy in his policies, his daily behavior, his, uh, you know, disregard for the conditions, the terrible conditions of the people. These uh, have made him, he cannot take a car. You know, he always has to fly places, just like the American ambassador in the capital itself. Uh, as I said, when there's no protection from abroad, he will be gone. Uh, in two or three months, you can be sure.